many are labeled flushable, but they don't break down in the sewer system afterwards. Our operators will have to reach in and physically remove the rag from the impeller. And these are complex food nutrients that Mother Nature has created. Why tear them apart? Welcome to the Sustainable Region, I'm Vanessa Timmer. On today's show, we'll look at a business that uses bugs and old bread to build the circular economy, and we'll tell you what that means. But first, a bit about this location. This nondescript building is the Sapperton Pump Station. It's in Newest Minster and underneath the SkyTrain line, which you can sometimes hear. It's also at the east end of the kilometer-long Sapperton Landing Park which is also part of the larger Metro Vancouver Brunette Fraser Regional Greenway. There are 33 buildings similar to this one throughout Metro Vancouver, and likely you haven't paid much attention to them, but boy you'd notice if they weren't there. Inside here, sewage is gurgling, about the equivalent of a car full of sewage every second. Liquid waste, the more polite term, flows here from several eastern municipalities, mostly by gravity then it's pumped about 12 kilometers to the Anasis Wastewater Treatment Plant. We joined one of the crews that helps care for these pumping stations and do we ever appreciate their work. We also got a new perspective on what happens after you flush. It's early morning at one of the Metro Vancouver sewer crew works yards. The teams are getting their assignments for the day. That's yours. Whoever's going with him, him and him. These are workers who mentally map the city in a way that most people don't. The 530 kilometers of sewer mains and the five treatment plants the mains ultimately drain into. That's how they see the region. There's also 33 pump stations in the system, and that's where they spend much of their time. They take care of what most of us don't even want to think about, where it all goes after you flush. Well, yeah, we're a little different. <laughs> Today, they're at the Port Moody pump station for routine cleaning and inspection. Okay, pump's on, Joe. Joe will head into the wet well side of the building. It contains a small pool. Not for swimming in, it's fed by incoming sewage. That's grease buildup. If you don't keep up on it, they'll just get thicker and thicker. These pumps have impellers inside, basically spinning fans that draw the sewage up and onward. All this stuff has to be able to pass by. That's where all the, the towels and, you know, extra socks you can't find, they're in here. Footwear aside, what is regularly appearing is a new culprit, disposable wipes. They've become really popular in recent years. We've all seen them, they include baby wipes, personal hygiene wipes or uh, makeup wipes. There are cleaning wipes. Many are labeled flushable when they actually aren't flushable in the true sense. They can go down your toilet, but they don't break down in the sewer system afterwards. They bind together with other objects or other components in the sewer, such as grease and Q-tips, other garbage, you know, dental floss, hair, and you get what's called a roping effect. And this is when they twist together and bind together and suddenly their strength is increased. Wipes and other materials will eventually form a ball that we would call a rag, and that will build up and prohibit flow from coming through the pump. We had an incident at Baines Road a few years ago, the pump station in Pitt Meadows. Things can jam up to the point where equipment can break and raw sewage can also go out the door into the environment. The incident wasn't pretty, and it has prompted a campaign by Metro Vancouver to educate people about so-called flushable wipes. Wipes can survive their entire trip through the sewer system, clogging sewer lines, pumps, and even your own pipes. Okay, we're downstairs uh, in the dry well of Port Moody Pump Station. We're going to isolate the pump and drain it and look in the inspection ports to see if there's any rags caught in the impeller. Our operators will have to drain that whole system out. They will have to reach in and physically remove the rag from the impeller. 
Sometimes the rag ball will just fall right out. Uh, other times they have to reach in and unhook it from the impeller or, or whatever it's snagged on. It takes a lot of our day up. It's not fun. It's a bundle of clothing, dish towels, but a large part of it is the sandy wipes. And they'll just pick up other material as, as they go, and then they'll just get bigger and bigger and bigger. And the grease is like almost like a bonding agent. Once they're together, they're staying together until they get in here and we pull them out. This is pretty minor, this one. I've seen some pretty big ones and nasty ones in the system. It's such a growing industry and market that we're starting to see more and more of these products coming into our system. There's more to just flushing your toilet. <laughs> well, you may think that, well, just throwing uh, I don't know, baby wipes in, in the toilet will not have an effect. It's a compound impact. Of course, they're not uh, biodegradable. A lot of uh, other things like um, grease going down the lines, so then it sort of solidifies. That combined with the products going down can be a real problem. It's understandable that consumers could be confused. Currently in Canada, there is no regulation for the word flushable. You can call any product flushable if you want. We need the public to actually step up and treat their sewers with the respect that they deserve. We are asking people not to flush wipes and instead to put them in the garbage. If the issue is that your wipe you feel is a little bit too icky, people could look at making sure they have a garbage, a well-sealed one with a lid, or in some cases people could look at creating a separate um, garbage just for wipes if they want to go that route. Back at the pump station, Joe, Brian and Robin wrap up. The sewage will continue flowing through this pump station and 32 others, unnoticed by virtually everyone but these crews are well aware of its important public service role, and they'll be back in a few days to check it, and if they have to, derag it again. Deep beneath our city streets, slowly clogging our pipes and sewers, lurks a threat. Grease, hair, floss, and wet wipes come together to form large, gross obstructions called fatbergs. That's right. Fatbergs. Let that sink in for a minute. These fatbergs harden like concrete and make our system really sick. Everything we flush or send down our sinks travels through a vast network of pipes to Metro Vancouver treatment plants. It's like a huge digestive system we all share. And like your stomach, there are things that just don't digest very well. Like grease, pouring cooking oil, Fat and grease down our sinks and toilets create blockages, causing spills into the environment and people's basements. Every year, it costs us about $2 million just to unblock pipes, clean up spills, and remove grease buildup. And it's not just municipal and regional sewer lines. As soon as grease hits your plumbing, it begins to coat the pipes in your home. Grease should never be poured down the sink and adding soap or hot water doesn't make any difference. Scraping your plates clean before putting them in the sink or dishwasher does make a difference. In many municipalities, small amounts of grease can be wiped into your green bin. If you have lots of grease, like from a fryer, you can take it to a depot for recycling. Protect our plumbing. Wipe it. Green bin it. Now that we've seen inside a pump station, let me tell you more about the Sapperton one. It's about to be rebuilt, and as part of Metro Vancouver's focus on renewable resources, it will draw heat energy from the sewer pipes and pumps. And a public green space and habitat restoration will be included. We'll look at the park aspect in a moment, but meanwhile, remember to pay attention to what you flush. Toilets are amazing! They take care of some pretty gross stuff that we wouldn't want to deal with ourselves. But when you flush a disposable wipe, it makes your toilet and your sewer system work a lot harder. And sometimes not at all. The fact is, disposable wipes should not be flushed, even the ones that claim to be flushable. Toilet paper breaks down in seconds. Wipes don't. They can survive their entire trip through the sewer system, clogging sewer lines, pumps, and even your own pipes. And it's not just wipes. Facial tissues, diapers, cotton balls, 
Tampons, hey. dental floss, paper towels, and even hair can clog the system, causing backed up pipes, flooded basements, and sewage spills into our environment. So remember, the only things that should go in your toilet are pee, poo, and toilet paper. Everything else should be recycled, composted, or thrown in the garbage. Welcome back to the Sustainable Region. I'm now a few steps away from the Sapperton pump station where the Brunette and Fraser Rivers meet. This area is on its way to become the Cumberland Point Green Space, a part of Metro Vancouver's Brunette Fraser Regional Greenway. And public input sessions have started in New Westminster. This next story is of particular interest to me. Aside from hosting this fabulous show, I head up several projects that support the circular economy. Well, what's that? It's an economy that redefines waste as a resource. And some businesses are building this approach directly into their business plans. This former greenhouse in Langley houses a farm operation. It looks average enough on the outside, but inside, the livestock is not what you'd expect. We're a farming activity here. Uh, we're operating a hatchery, we operate insect rearing. So instead of growing chickens, for example, we're growing larvae. The only one of its kind, this plant here, the farm operation that we have. And it was really a challenge from David Suzuki, uh, who said, how else can we feed fish in fish farms? Rather than feeding them ground up fish in their pellets, can we use something else? These are black soldier flies, and millions of their larvae are grown to become high quality food for animals and plants. Once the insect larvae is fully grown, uh, we harvest them. Uh, we then wash them, we cook them, and dry them. And that product, which is just protein and oils, mainly, uh, goes to a feed manufacturer who would make uh, feed for fish, chickens, pigs, and we also make pet food. The adults are easy care guests as they have no mouths, but their larvae do eat. Their food, known as feedstock, is regulated by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency because they will become part of the human food chain. If it's post-consumer food waste, we can't deal with that because it's had some kind of human contact. Uh, it doesn't fit the CFIA regulations. Feedstock here, again, it's mainly fruits and vegetables. It comes from grocery stores. Um, it comes from the food processors, food packagers, uh, the people who make uh, the salads for the hotels and uh, the pre-prepared foods in your grocery stores. A lot of it's packaged, so we depackage here. They are removed from the food and we recycle all of those. We then grind up all the food, uh, so it looks like a fruit and veggie salsa, and that is pumped into tanks. And from the tanks, it's pumped into our insect rearing area and the insects eat it. One of their feedstock suppliers is Fresh Start Foods. We process uh, vegetables as well as fresh fruit. It's for use in hospitals, hotels, restaurants, various food service operations. We would process probably 30 to 40 million pounds of produce a year. 100% of all of, the, all of our organic waste we have uh, will be used in the Antara system to make food or become food as a, as a, as a feed product for uh, different chicken and fish. And so that, that, that's really exciting for us. That the two companies are cooperating to maximize the value of the waste resource illustrates a key emerging activity in the waste management industry. We feel like we're trailblazers on this one. We're, we're taking a look at um, the organic waste industry and we're separating it into pre-consumer. We're able to actually capture the nutrients within that material and upcycle it right back into the food chain in, in the form of protein and fertilizer. Whereas uh, post-consumer, that's perfect for composting and anaerobic digestion where you're capturing the energy. I mean, these are complex food nutrients that Mother Nature has created. Why tear them apart? Having resources available to companies which can maximize their value builds ecological and economic vibrancy in a region. We must protect our resources because once they're gone, they're gone. Antara is one of many local businesses that are helping build a circular economy. They understand the region's progressive landscape and reputation and specifically chose to operate here. The team now is a group of almost 30 people. Vancouver is way ahead of most cities in North America in utilizing the resources that we have in our waste. Production by mid next week. 
Great. These folks need support from industry to say we, we believe in the concept and I, I'm uh, holding good promise for uh, the Intera folks. It looks like they're doing a very good job. Intera products are selling well in the United States and once Canadian federal approval is obtained, the goal is to supply local farmers. We have to think about what we're doing now with all our waste materials. Being able to enhance values of those streams and, and produce more food locally is very important. It's about local food security. That's our show for today. You can see more about how our region works by going to Metro Vancouver's blog or follow us on Twitter at Metro Vancouver. I'm Vanessa Timmer. Thanks for making Metro Vancouver a sustainable region.